Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to everyone for this welcome. Mr. Speaker, congratulations for your presidency. I'm honored by my electors as the first deputy you newly created of Mississauga said, I wish to congratulate all new members elected and newly elected in this assembly. It's this assembly for the very first time as the member of provincial parliament for the new riding of Mississauga Centre. <laughs> Though some may say that my journey to this role may have seemed improbable, on June the 7th, constituents of Mississauga Centre spoke loud and clear. They elected someone who lives in their riding and who respects and understands its religious, ethnic, and cultural diversity. Someone who, like so many of them, immigrated to Canada and appreciates the unique challenges that new Canadians face. Someone that does not shy away from the hard work and accountability for her words and actions. I want them to know that I do not take this responsibility lightly, and I will work hard each and every single day to deliver on what they sent me here to do. As I door knocked in my riding, my constituents made it clear to me that their concerns were about the riding costs of hydro, hallway health care, wasteful spending, the carbon tax, and the message was clear. Ontarians were ready for change. This is why I am so proud to be a member of a government that is acting quickly to keep our word to the people of Ontario. As I mentioned earlier, I am proud to represent one of the most multi-ethnic ridings in Ontario. In fact, there are over 100 languages spoken in my riding, of which I am proud to speak five. As someone who grew up and spent my formative years in my riding, I was fortunate to benefit from the diverse mosaic of cultures, religions, languages, and people from all over the world and different walks of life, all of which have shaped the person who I am today. I myself am of Polish, Czech, and Slovak heritage, and 100% Canadian and proud. Like many of my constituents, my family and I had to work hard to build our lives here, and we understand the value of the taxpayer dollar. Respecting your hard work will always be one of the greatest importance to me. My parents overcame diversity and sacrificed more than I could ever know to bring our family to Canada. When I was born, Europe was in the process of overthrowing a communist regime that had crushed freedom and limited opportunity for its people. <laughs> My parents had a difficult and life-changing decision to make. In fact, the hardship of immigration was so difficult that it ultimately ended their marriage. However, Canada remained a beacon of hope for me, my younger brother, and my mom. As a single mother, my mom raised two very energetic children while holding down several jobs and providing a loving and safe household. For me, the definition of hard work is one word, motherhood. My mother instilled in me the idea of a lifelong dedication to a cause. My mother's cause was her family, and as a result, I was afforded the best opportunities possible. She not only helped me surpass all obstacles, but taught me the values of hard work, personal responsibility, and never giving up. She would always say, be careful how you make your bed, because you will have to sleep in it. For her work and dedication and for believing in me, she has my heart and my internal gratitude. Above all, it is for her and for the many hardworking Ontario mothers and fathers out there that we work. While my mother influenced my sense of work ethic and dedication, it was my father's own vocation as a physician that inspired my path to healthcare. His influence and incredible intellect during my formative years would contribute to my passion to helping others. From an early age, I knew that I would dedicate my life to the service of others. After completing two Bachelor of Science degrees, I became a registered nurse. As a nursing student, I spent close to 1,600 unpaid nursing hours working and learning at various hospitals in Toronto. Once I completed my studies, I started working as a staff RN in the emergency room of a local hospital, as well as a correctional nurse at a female correctional facility. It is at this time, Mr. Speaker, that I felt my calling to become politically involved. 
Over the last few days, I have been listening intensely to my colleagues bring up hallway health care. Although hallway health care has become the catchphrase we all recognize, the term that I believe is more appropriate is hallway nursing. Nurses like me often are the first point of contact with our healthcare system for many patients. Nurses are the ones who spend 24-7 at the bedside, in the hallway, struggling to maintain a level of care that is dignified, professional, and compassionate. I've said this many times during my campaign, and I would like to say it once again today. A hallway is not a place of work, and it definitely is not a place of healing. Mr. Speaker, I will never forget one of my first shifts in the ER. It was a busy night as any. The hospital was in code gridlock, and the staff was happy that we haven't reached super gridlock yet. I was working in the ambulatory care center of the ER that night. A young woman came in, about my age, 15 weeks pregnant. She was having cramps and bleeding. After taking her blood work and scheduling her for an ultrasound, due to the lack of beds, we sent her back out into the waiting room, which is considered routine practice. Sometime later, while still waiting for the ultrasound, her husband came in, visibly distraught, asking us to check on his wife. At this point, it was clear that she was having a miscarriage. I began frantically looking into patient rooms, triaging in my mind who is the most able that could be taken out at this point so we could move this young woman into a room. At this point, there wasn't even room in the hallway. That's what code gridlock means. Mr. Speaker, time ran out. The young woman had miscarried in front of 30 strangers in a hospital waiting room. She was wheeled in simply too late. Mr. Speaker, I will never forget the look on her face and the way I felt in that moment. No one should ever have to experience such a tragedy. In the most vulnerable moment in any woman's life, not having that privacy and human dignity is simply devastating. It was in this moment that I truly understood how badly the previous Liberal government had failed us, all of us, the patients, their families, the frontline staff. Unfortunately, stories such as these are not unique or exceptional. They happen daily, as many of my colleagues can attest, hand in hand with hallway nursing across Ontario hospitals. The deplorable conditions I witnessed at work were demoralizing and heartbreaking. Our broken, failing Ontario health care system, a legacy of 15 years of liberal devastation and mismanagement, is finally in the hands of a government that will work for the people. Yeah. It doesn't help that Ontario has the lowest RN to population ratio in Canada, but among the highest administrators per bed ratio. It is estimated that our province has only 669 RNs per 100,000 people, compared to 828 RNs per 100,000 people across the rest of Canada. This equation is off balance. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize my colleagues present here today from the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, with CEO Dr. Doris Grinspoon and President Angela Cooper Brethwaite, who have been sounding the alarm to the former Liberal government about the escalating health care crisis for years. This alarm had fallen of deaf years, but no longer. A new day has dawned in Ontario with the election of 76 progressive Conservative MPPs with Premier Doug Ford at the helm. Ending hallway medicine, or hall hallway nursing, I should say, was one of our party's top campaign commitments. The throne speech reaffirmed our commitment to the people of Ontario, who have been given our government a clear mandate to deliver real change for the people. The infusion of 15,000 new long-term care beds over the next five years and a historic $3.8 billion investment in mental health and addictions, including supportive housing, is just the beginning. These two very clear and deliverable commitments will help to ease the burden on our acute care institutions and will allow our patients to be treated in the proper settings with the appropriate supports at the appropriate cost. This, in turn, will result in decreased wait times and bringing closer the end of hallway nursing. I know that my colleagues across the aisle seem to be surprised that this government is actually doing exactly what we said we would do. 
For example, our government's announcement on the creation of an independent financial commission of inquiry <laughs> into Ontario's past spending and accounting practices is yet another promise made and promise kept. This decisive action will restore the public's trust and provide an honest and accurate picture of where our province stands financially. The people of Ontario deserve to know where their hard-earned taxpayer dollars are being spent. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my campaign team for their unwavering support, their countless hours of volunteer work that has made this moment possible. I am forever grateful to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you.